Just a few weeks ago on Yom Kippur evening, Kol Nidre evening, I spoke about the unity that we felt 50 years ago at the time of the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. I spoke about the unity we felt then and during previous crises, during the Six-Day War in 1967, in 1948, when war was declared right after Israel announced its independence. And last, just a couple of weeks ago, I said at that sermon, quote, regrettably, when I talked about these days when we were so united, I said, regrettably, those days of unity, solidarity, and clarity of purpose are over. And tonight I say, regrettably, those days of unity, solidarity, and clarity of purpose have returned. We are united in a way which we have not been since these previous crises. In one of the messages that I sent out earlier this week, I mentioned an old adage. Some of you may have heard it before. I know we used to hear, I used to hear it quite often. And that was that if Arab armies were to lay down their weapons, and if they were all to take a day off, nothing would happen. Because Israel would not attack. Israel doesn't seek additional land or to conquer anywhere. And then we said, but if somehow Israel was to lay down its defenses for a day, there would be a massacre. And now we know it wasn't just an adage or a saying or propaganda, but in fact, it was true. Now, there's another thing we always used to say, and that was, you know, if the Arabs were smart, instead of attacking us, they would just let us be and fight among ourselves. And in fact, that's what's been happening these last number of months. But that's where they misread the situation. Because from what it appears, Hamas thought that because of the divisions in Israel, Israel was weak. They thought because of the demonstrations where people were told not to serve in the army, not to go for the call up of reserves, this would be an opportune time to attack. Not to mention, of course, the fact that Israel was making progress in expanding the Abraham Accords, expanding the peace that's already been now brought with the UAE, with Bahrain, with Morocco, and other countries. And now, perhaps, hopefully, maybe still Saudi Arabia, although it's very hard to read those tea leaves. But they thought because of the internal divisions in Israel and because of these calls to resist and not to call up, accept calls to the reserves that this was an ideal time to attack. But they were wrong. Because when Israel issued its call for reserves, they didn't have 100% turnout. They had 150%. Those of us who know anything about math know that's impossible. And they wonder how, that's, how that happened. But what happens is when they call up or need to call up let's say uh, 300,000 reserves, they send notices out to more than the number of people because they know that somebody may have a doctor's appointment, somebody may be getting married, somebody may have another reason why they can't come. And so they call more than they actually need. And in this case, in this time, as has happened before, when Israel was struck by an outside enemy, the call was answered in full force. And people from around the world who were not in Israel came and responded and returned to be able to serve with their units. Our shaliach, Ido Naaman, went to serve with his unit. Our previous shaliach, Nadav Leibowitz, is serving with his unit. Ten of my wife's nephews answered the call and are serving with their units. That's what it means to be a part of this nation, of this people to answer the call. And at times such as this, we come together. It's a time of Jewish unity and solidarity, the likes of which we haven't seen in many, many years. So remember it and hold on to it because it won't endure forever. Indeed, after the war, there will be painful recrimination. There will be finger pointing. There will be investigations. There will be analysis and there will be resignations and there will be calls for resignations and it will be messy. But for now, for now we are united. 
I remember one of the first midrashim I ever learned in rabbinical school was a midrash that talked about a reed, a simple reed, and that a reed can be broken easily, but that when a whole bunch of reeds are held together, you actually really can't break them. And that midrash was referring to the Jewish people, that when we are together and when we are united, we can't be broken. And so on Yom Kippur evening, I said the following words. I said, I have faith in Israel, in its people and its ability to solve tough problems, especially when it pulls together and faces its problems with united front. Now, I'm not usually in the habit of quoting from previous sermons or to share words that I've said before, but this is what I said then. I said, we are family. And so we should not let, we should not be fighting each other. We should join together as soldiers in the war to fight the public opinion campaign waged against Israel. Earlier today, by the way, Simcha and I were at the rally and some of others, a number of members of our congregation were there as well. Raise your hands if you were able to be there downtown today to stand in solidarity. As we were walking out, one of the things that was kind of surprising, there weren't really any counter protest. I think people were kind of disappointed actually. But at any rate, as we were walking back to our car and I was wearing, I wasn't wearing this tie, but I had some paraphernalia that clearly identified where I was coming from. I was holding flag of Israel. And there were people who were walking in the opposite direction, a young woman who looked to be Palestinian or Arab, and she shouted, um, free Palestine. And I answered and said, I agree. Free Palestine from Hamas. Free Palestine from Hamas. Because Hamas is holding not just the Israeli people, the 130 to 150 that they've captured as hostages, they're holding all of Gaza as hostage. And the analogies that we've read, that we've heard, that we've seen are so very important. Right now, the world is with us. And by the way, when you look at the places where the hostages come from, they come from the Netherlands, they come from France, they come from Hungary. In Hungary, as a matter of fact, the ambassador spoke at the uh, 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 rally today. And he said that in Hungary, they have outlawed any pro-Palestinian demonstrations going on at this time. To which I said, there are certain advantages to dictatorships. <laughs> but in France, they've actually outruled pro-Hamas demonstrations because there are French citizens that are being held there. So if you think for a moment, there are French people from France. There are, of course, we know Americans. There are people from Italy. There are people from all over the world. Why is that? Because there's this concept in Judaism called kibbutz hagaliyot. Kibbutz hagaliyot means the ingathering of the exiles, that we come from all over the world, the four corners of the world, and this is our homeland, regardless of where we live. We are in the diaspora, but our hearts are there. It was Yehuda HaLevi in the Middle Ages who said, Ani ma'arav, belibi b'mizrach. I am in the West, but my heart is in the East. And he was referring to the fact that his heart was Be'eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. It's interesting. When I sent out the sermon I gave on Yom Kippur, someone who's not Jewish wrote the following back to me. He said, what confuses me most about synagogue Judaism because he read the sermon, is the emphasis on Israel over God, the creator. He said, as a Christian, I understand the earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. I say this with humility. I truly hope to be in God's presence after this life. And I've been thinking a lot about that when he said, why is it that we emphasize Israel so much? And the reason is because we are Israel. To be a Jew, the name Yehudi does not appear in the Talmud. The name for Jewish people is Yisrael, which is why we say in the Talmud, Ko Yisrael Aravin Zebazet, all of Israel, meaning all the Jewish people, are responsible for one another. That's the way that's always interpreted. But I see it as even more than that. It is that all of Israel is bound together. And that's what that means. And how beautiful and how fortunate we are to see that other nations of the world, perhaps because they have captives that are being held by Hamas have united in condemning what Hamas has done. If there's ever a moment for moral clarity, this is it. If there's ever a moment to understand the difference between evil and the incarnation of evil and innocence, this is it. And if you can't make that distinction, then something is wrong with your moral compass. 
and let anyone who tells you otherwise and supports Hamas that they are dead wrong. They are dead wrong. <coughs> and so as we have this concept of the Jews coming together from all over, wherever we may be, let us cherish this moment of unity and how fortunate we are. The Congress of the United States stands with Israel. I've been told that as soon as the they have a speaker, they'll be able to pass a resolution. As it is now, they can't pass any resolutions. But that some 417 members of Congress are all co-sponsoring a resolution. A resolution condemning Hamas, standing with Israel, and so on. That's the power of what's going on right now. President Biden has spoken so beautifully and forcefully. And Secretary Blinken, unbelievable what he has said. His stepfather, by the way, is a scholar, was a Holocaust survivor and a scholar of the Holocaust. And so when he said, I come here today and I speak as a Jew, and then as I heard him speak this morning, words I never expected to hear from an American Secretary of State, he said, Israel not only has the right to wipe out Hamas, he says they have an obligation to wipe out Hamas. That's extraordinary. And so back to the words that I shared just a couple of weeks ago, Yom Kippur evening. I said, the battle we should be fight is against the battle to delegitimize de and demonize Israel and, and against double standards. We should be fighting the smearing of Israel in the United Nations and holding the Palestinians accountable for their anti-Jewish rhetoric and rewarding terrorism. Because as long as the Palestinians, not just in Hamas and not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank as well, as long as they're able to continue to have prayer books that teach and inculcate hatred and brainwash their people and pass out candy when Jewish children are killed, as long as that is tolerated, there's no hope for peace. It has nothing to do with settlements. It has nothing to do with borders or land. It has to do with acceptance of another people. That was why a few years ago, and there were those who, here in America, who were upset by the fact that the Netanyahu government insisted on passing a law which stated that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people and demand that it be recognized as such. Because until that happens, there can be no peace. And until, as long as they continue to teach mathematics in the following way, and this is done not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank as well, with t textbooks that are paid, many of them by the United Nations, and when they teach math, they teach, if you have five Jews and you kill four of them, how many are left? As long as that happens, there's no hope. But we're a people that strives for hope. The national anthem of Israel is called Hatikva, the hope. And so we work and we try and find those words, those individuals who are among the peacemakers. At the rally today, there was a woman named Anila Ali, Pakistani Muslim woman who said, this murderous act is not committed in the name of my Allah or the name of my people or my religion. She was extraordinarily brave and she spoke there. Anila Ali is a friend. She's been here at B'nai Tzedek. When we had the iftar this past year, she was our guest and she will be with us again in the coming year when once again B'nai Tzedek will host an iftar. And it's one of the reasons why I went to Bahrain and the UAE and met with people there in order to, courage, to, in order to encourage and give oxygen and hope to those voices in the Arab and Muslim world who believe in peace, who believe in taking a different path than Hamas. And so I concluded the sermon the other night by saying, we should be rallying not against Israel, but its enemies and holding them accountable. We should be vociferous in fighting against the despicable conference taking place at the University of Pennsylvania and similar, similar efforts on other college campuses to malign Israel and intimidate Jewish students. And so I would add to that, anyone here who went to college, I think a couple of you have probably gone to college, right? And you have a right then to write to your college, especially if you contribute anything, to make sure that they understand the moral clarity and difference between evil and Israel's right to protect its citizens and defend its citizens. And so, 
we should be vigilantly working to ensure also that Iran not acquire nuclear weapons. And so I conclude now with the words I concluded on Erev Yom Kippur. The Midrash tells us that it wasn't until the people of Israel were united as one, encamped in front of Mount Sinai, that God gave us the Torah. May we heed the call of Golda Meir in 1947 when she challenged us, quote, to realize the peril of our situation and do what you have to do. And then I said, may the unity we felt then and the unity we felt 50 years ago at the time of the Yom Kippur War be renewed and restored. Yes, we knew we had what we had to do then, and we did it. May we do it again and again. And may we join in the age-old prayer for the peace of Jerusalem and for the welfare of the Jewish people. Ken Yehirutsono, so may it be thy will. May this come to pass, and let us say, Amen.